Julian Lindsay uh, works at the National Center for Infection in Cancer and Transplantation uh, in Australia. And he's based in the US. Uh, and so that was something that I had to get my head around. I wasn't sure where he was. And um, I was informed that he's in Seattle and he's with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. And his talk today is gonna be on a, when we talk about difficult to treat um, drugs or, or drugs that have a very interesting pharmacokinetic profile, voriconazole is one that you can't go past when you think about it. Uh, so his talk is gonna be on precision-based dosing of voriconazole. And to give a bit of a background on Julian, uh, he is a pharmacist and he's completed his PhD and he's a clinician researcher at the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Center in Seattle, as I've said and also based in Melbourne as well. Uh, he's also an experienced bone marrow transplant pharmacist, previously working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, in Australia, and he's authored a number of peer-reviewed journals and national guidelines. Uh, his research interests include prevention of opportunistic infections in patients with blood cancers and those, those undergoing cellular therapies, particularly CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, invasive fungal infections, and the use of pharmacogenomics to guide antimicrobials. So Julian, with, without further delay, I'd like you to present to us your, your interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for dialing in for the talk. Um, so today I'm going to discuss uh, precision-based dosing of voriconazole. Um, so firstly, uh, it does voriconazole still have a place in therapy. Um, a lot of drugs have come out in the last 20 years, a lot of new azoles since Vori came to market. And um, is all of this worth it? So having a look at the most one of the most recent international guidelines published, which is the Australian Antifungal Guidelines, um, voriconazole is still first-line prophylaxis with a strong recommendation for high-risk hematology patients as an alternate to posaconazole. So still quite an uh, important role there for a lot of people that can't um, tolerate what would now be the mainstay prophylaxis um, of POSA. Um, however, it's also first-line therapy with a level one to two grade strong recommendation for pulmonary invasive aspergillosis in those not already on a mold active prophylaxis. Um, and I think more importantly, and where you really see voriconazole's use as vital, is in those in infections such as uh, sketosporiosis, um, fusariosis, and lamentospora. So I think... Um, there's still a very important role for voriconazole, and um, especially when it's used to treat these very invasive um, fungal infections, uh, it's vital to dose appropriately. Now, um, well back, almost 20 years now, there has been evidence to say that um, voriconazole has a narrow therapeutic index, and it's pretty vital to get those doses in the right positions. So there was a paper 15 years ago by Pascal that showed that any level uh, trough concentration less than one milligram per liter um, had over 50% lack of response, um, whereas above one had only a 12% uh, lack of response. So clearly um, it needs to be therapeutic above levels of one, 1 1.5 even as argued, um, and potentially higher if CNS infections. And they also showed that adverse effects were almost always in levels above 5.5 uh, milligrams per liter, um, with especially the CNS side effects like um, hallucinations um, and visual disturbances. So we have a clear therapeutic index in which to aim for, but the challenge now is getting everyone in that index. So uh, we did an analysis at the Fred Hutch in Seattle um, about how well we're doing. There's been pretty good guidelines about what levels we should be aiming for for over 10 years. And we thought we'd revisit and see what the usage of voriconazole is at the hospital and how well we're obtaining levels. Um, and in a 30-month period uh, for all antifungals, and this is a cancer care hospital, um, this is not the general population, um, there was a lot of antifungal use, almost 500 patients with an antifungal prescribed, of which um, there was roughly half of them had voriconazole. Um, and a, a, 
about 25% were voriconazole alone. Um, however, there was a lot of people that had both POSA and then transitioned to vori or vice versa, and a small proportion that even had both Isavu, POSA, and vori. So if you're definitely working in this clinical space, you know that you switch and change drugs based on prophylaxis or treatment or empiric treatment. And that's really what we are seeing with uh, 30% for prophylaxis and about 60% for empiric or directed treatment. Um, about 60% uh, about 60 were post-transplant, post-allo transplant, so definitely a high usage in that area, which is very important um, continuing on um, in the talk. We'll get to that. And about 30% pre-transplant. And looking at levels, um, this top figure here, you can see that only 50% were within that target range of one to five um, at a median of day six, uh, when we generally take the first level. And about um, a quarter of patients were super therapeutic and a quarter was subtherapeutic. Those that had a subsequent level um, at a median of 17 days after, still only 50% was, were therapeutic. Um, and then if they were still having levels and still on voriconazole at the third level at a median of 29 days, um, it was starting to get more like 70% uh, therapeutic. And this bottom figure is actually showing each individual patient that had a sub-therapeutic level um, at that first uh, point. And you can see that a lot of patients do become therapeutic after a dose adjustment. However, there's still a large proportion of patients that despite dose adjustment, even after a month, 40 days after starting therapy, was sub-therapeutic. And that is a group that is very problematic. If you're treating uh, lamentospora or fusarium infection, you want to have adequate uh, voriconazole levels. And it's it's pretty bad to have subtherapeutic levels for a month after starting it, if that's one of the only therapies that that person can tolerate. Um, and so let's have a quick uh, talk about the background to voriconazole, a very brief PKPD summary of vori. So it's 96% bioavailable in adults anyway, um, with absorption in one to two hours. Its metabolism is primarily hepatic the major pathway is CYP2C19, um, with uh, as well as less significantly CYP2C9 and 3A4. Now, CYP2C19 is saturable, which means it's gonna, it's not gonna be a linear, and that's why you can often see levels 0.5, 1, then you do a small dose adjustment, all of a sudden it's up around 10, and then it stays there for a little while because CYP2C19 is saturated, um, and the levels going up without it um, having the same level of metabolism. Now, CYP2C19 also exhibits a lot of genetic polymorphisms, and um, we'll get onto those details details shortly. Uh, Half-life elimination is variable and dose dependent. So steady states about three days after an IV loading dose or five to eight days without a loading dose. Um, and in children, especially those two to 12, um, metabolism is much faster than in adults and absorption is reduced. So you need much higher doses um, in children than in adults. So a few general considerations, because I don't want to just be talking about pharmacogenomics and not really be summarizing for conazole as a whole, because you want to be able to walk away saying, well, next time I have a patient with voriconazole, I want to know what to think about because there are other things other than just pharmacogenomics to think about. So like I talked about age, children 12, uh, two to 12 need much higher doses. So recommended doses are nine milligram per kilogram for oral doses up to 350. And to put that in context for those not familiar with normal dosing, um, generally the standard dose for voriconazole is a six milligram per kilogram load for uh, BD for a day and then four milligram per kilogram. So it's much, much higher in children. Um, and it's not registered for children less than two. Um, we talked about CYP2C19, but you, as well as polymorphisms, you have to think about interactions, interactions with drugs when you're starting, as well as interactions with drugs that may be started um, throughout the course of the voriconazole. So obviously bread and butter, remember those interactions. The CYP genotype, which we'll discuss. And then other things that have been associated with voriconazole levels are inflammation. So there are a lot of papers that have correlated with CR using CRP as a surrogate for inflammation, um, that inflammation is directly related to levels Levels. However, inflammation and CRP as a surrogate, it's highly variable. It's not very quantifiable. Um, and so it's very difficult to use as a surrogate to choose a dose. But it's definitely something to keep in mind when your patient is changing their it, if the, the, the state, whether they are septic, whether they were septic when you started voriconazole and then became not septic. So if there's large changes in the CRP, I think it's worth 
uh, retesting levels of voriconazole because um, it has shown to, to affect that a lot. Um, so is there a role for AUC MIC? So there are papers that show that you could be using um, an AUC for MIC ratio um, for dosing voriconazole, but they're very well correlated with just using trough levels. So as far as I know, um, no paper has really shown a benefit of using AUC over MIC over just using routine trough levels. Um, and that goes with Bayesian methods as well. There are some Bayesian models out there, but the clinical implications or the clinical implementation of using those models in voriconazole, to my knowledge, um, hasn't been shown to benefit in a clinical circumstance yet. It, that might change um, as we have uh, these excellent machine model learnings that we um, discussed. Okay, so... Uh, getting into actual pharmacogenomic testing to help voriconazole dosing. So there is a consortium called the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC, that have some really great guidelines for different drugs that are affected by uh, pharmacogenomics of uh, predominantly CYP um, metabolism. And CYP2C19 is uh, divided into five different categories. So there is CYP2C19 ultra-rapid metabolizers, which 2 to 5% of people fall into this category. And this would mean that they're carrying two increased functional alleles. So star 17, they're homozygous star 17, star 17, um, or star 17 diplotype. Um, so this group of patients are more uncommon, um, much higher proportions in Asian background, around 30% of Asian background are rapid or ultra rapid metabolizers. Um, but as a whole worldwide, two to 5% of patients will be in this category and they uh, rapidly metabolize voriconazole. So their CYP2C19 have increased function, which um, then therefore correlates to much lower levels with the standard dosing. Um, so then there are rapid metabolizers, which two to 30% of the population fall into. And these are heterozygotes for star 17. So usually star one slash 17. And so they carry one functional allele um, for increased function of 2C19. Then there are normal and intermediate metabolizers. So 50% of people, roughly 50 to sort of, if you combine the two, 60% um, fall into this category. And these are your star one, one uh, homozygous, star one, two, one, three, two, 17. And this, these proportion have normal functional CYP2 seed 19s. Um, and they, they usually have uh, therapeutic levels um, with standard dosing. And then the fifth category, which is two to 15% of patients are actually poor metabolizers. So they carry two non-functional alleles for CYP2C19. So this would be star two, star two, star two, star three, or star three, star three. Um, and these would have uh, reduced CYP2C19 function. Therefore, for the same dose would have much higher voriconazole levels. And this would be the patients that are sitting ducks for that super therapeutic levels that would then lead to more toxic side effects like hallucinations and CNS side effects. Um, um, when they initiate therapy. So the paper does give some background to dosing recommendations um, that we could use, but they're very vague, unfortunately. So for ultra rapid metabolizers and rapid metabolizers, um, they recommend uh, using a, an alternate agent if possible, normal metabolizers, intermediate, normal dose, and poor metabolizers, um, an alternate agent if possible or st uh, strong evidence for therapeutic monitoring to reduce toxic side effects. Um, but that's not sometimes in some circumstances, you don't want to be using a different agent and you want to be able to uh, dose for a conazole appropriately using this. So in the last five to 10 years, there's been a huge amount of publications um, on prospective CYP2C19 guided dosing. Um, uh, papers by Hicks, Lamoro, Tribbiano in Australia, and Lynn. Um, then I wanted to just briefly discuss uh, one paper by Patel et al., who pre-transplant, so during the transplant workup, all patients had a CYP2C9 genotype tested because they used voriconazole as their standard prophylaxis for um, mold active prophylaxis during their uh, allo transplant. Um, so what they did was compare to historical control and as a total cohort, 50% uh, of the historical control 
on the first fluoroconazole level were therapeutic, which it almost exactly matches uh, our hospital's data. So it seems to be the sort of without using anything additional than just levels, um, what uh, first levels would achieve. Um, and then after implementing uh, genotype guided dosing, which sorry, I should have mentioned is ultra rapid metabolizers and rapid metabolizers, instead of the standard 200 milligram oral twice a day dose of fluoroconazole, those um, uh, genotypes or phenotypes based on their genotype uh, receive 300 milligrams BD. So it's not very, very high level changes. It's just pinpointing that group that would need upfront higher levels. And um, those that group after that uh, implementing um, had uh, th a reduction in sub-therapeutic levels on first level down to 30%. But actually looking at the cohort where there was a change to therapy, so those ultra-rapid and rapid metabolizers with that higher dose, um, the historical control 70% was sub-therapeutic in that first level, whereas only 15% was sub-therapeutic um, after just changing that 200 standard to 300 milligrams. So um, that was quite a profound uh, result um, and something to uh, work towards. So how to then implement this um, for all patients and in current centers. So the problem was a lot of previous studies have preemptively tested 2C19. So this is particularly relevant if you have um, like the Patel study, uh, standard of care was Vori prophylaxis, you have time to get the sample sent away. Uh, often it's quite cheap to send away to batch uh, in private labs that can batch that and send it back within a week or two. Um, however, if you have a patient, they have a diagnosis of fusarium, you want to start voriconazole and get therapeutic levels ASAP, how can you implement that at your center? Um, and so this is our machine. Uh, it's the sample that you, so you need to have a blood sample, um, which I'll get to blood at the moment anyway, um, which then you de extract DNA and put it through a quant studio for PC. It's just a PCR um, test. And uh, generally by the time you can get blood drawn, send it to the lab, extract DNA and run it through uh, PCR that takes a couple of hours. It's usually 24 to 48 hour turnaround time as a minimum. So uh, at our center, we've been working on real time dose adjustments um, after initiating therapy. So what our normal flow chart for initiating voriconazole would be, would be obviously it's initiated. Uh, a, a normal loading dose and maintenance dose is charted, which uh, we use the milligram per kilogram dose rather than the standard 200 milligrams for everyone. Um, so six milligram, per, six milligram per kilogram load for two doses, then four milligram per kilogram BD thereafter. Standard trough levels are ordered for five to seven days, um, no matter what we're doing, that we still want to know after five to seven days what's going on with the patient. But as well as ordering the voriconazole, we also order a CYP2C19 genotype on blood for non-allergenic transplants. And this is one of those challenges I was discussing that right now, uh, to my knowledge anyway, um, only blood is validated for the test. And if you are testing an allogeneic transplant's blood um, for their CYP2C9 genotype, you're actually testing the liver function of their donor, um, not of them. And so we're trying to validate a buccal swab or buccal swab. Um, however, there's problems with cross-contamination with buccal swabs. And so um, if you have some pre-transplant blood just lying around frozen that you can extract DNA out of, that would work. Um, the other thing to check is if they've actually had a SIP report. A lot of patients, especially here in the US, pre-allo transplant have been getting a full SIP panel tested. Um, but regardless, if there is no blood and there is not a previous SIP test at the moment, only blood uh, is validated. And so we can't use um, post-allergenic um, blood to test for CYP2C19. Uh, so for everyone else though, we get those results back within 48 hours and dose adjust according to a nomogram that we've put together, which is shown here. So this is a pretty busy slide. Sorry about the tiny writing, um, but essentially this is uh, the summary of the different phenotypes, ultra rapid, rapid, normal, intermediate, and poor. And I've sort of summarized the CPIC therapeutic recommendations, which as I discussed are very vague, as well as those four main publications with dosage recommendations um, published in the last sort of five or six years. Um, and then what we are using um, as a rough guideline or proposed to be using in this pilot. 
Um, so ultra rapid metabolizers, uh, Lynn didn't give adjustments. Hicks avoided in this patient population. Patel still dosed this at 300 oral 12 hourly. And the uh, Lamero, which is a modeling, um, it, it's not a clinical paper, sort of recommended a six milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. So we would recommend if possible, an alternate agent, if not possible, five to six milligrams every 12 hours. And if a dose adjustment has been made and five to seven days later, a level is still subtherapeutic, we would increase each dose of that 12 hourly dosing by a hundred milligrams. Um, so rapid metabolizers, pretty much the same other than evidence-based Hicks did um, increase this to 300 every 12 hours as, as well as Patel. Um, the Lamoro uh, paper estimated that they would need four milligram per kilogram, but the range was two to seven. So still quite a large range in this patient population. So we would be using this five to six milligram uh, dose every 12 hours as well. And again, increasing by the 12 hourly. Now, a few things to keep in mind with these higher doses. This is a bit of an evidence-free zone, but anecdotally, and there's a few small case reports that um, to avoid peak uh, CNS side effects to divide this dose into TDS dosing. So divide the total daily dose into three times a day instead of twice a day um, for these ultra rapid metabolizers and rapid metabolizers. There is a few case reports of adding a CYP2C19 inhibitor like omeprazole to these patients. However, this is very variable and this would be purely based on if a clinician really wanted to do it. And the other thing to keep in mind is with these higher doses, even though they're metabolizing voriconazole faster, they are still putting a lot more uh, fluoride that is with voriconazole um, into the system. And so there is a, a higher chance of the um, fluorosis that you can have, uh, which you can sometimes see for prolonged voriconazole use um, and the perio periostitis that you see from that um, fluorosis in that. So those things to keep in mind with those much higher doses. Uh, normal and intermediate, um, it's pretty consensus, either 200 milligram BD oral or the four milligram per kilogram twice a day. So we left that as uh, normal dosing. And then poor metabolizers, um, uh, both groups, so Hicks and Patel would give the normal dose. Um, the Lynn study showed 150 or 250, um, either IV or PO, or the Lamoureux showed 1.8 milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. If we can't use an alternate agent in these patients, um, we proposed and are using two milligram per kilogram every 12 hours up front. Um, since we've been piloting it, though, we haven't had any poor metabolizers come through. So, um, that is going to be something to wait for and see how it goes. Um, and yeah, again, increased by 50, but very close monitoring for toxicity in that patient group. And that is me. Thank you very much. And we'll have questions later. Thanks very much, Julian. That was uh, a very interesting presentation on a very difficult to treat drug. And depending on the subpopulation that you're treating, uh, even more so. So I appreciate um, the the level of detail that you 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 presented um, for voriconazole.